Tonight, thank you for joining us. Our final night of revival meetings. It's hard to believe this week has gone by fast, hasn't it? Uh, but it's been a good week. I've been challenged by the messages. Trust that you have as as well. The Holy Spirit's been working on my heart, and I trust He's been doing the same in your life through His Word. Well, we're going to begin tonight by a song that speaks about salvation, the cleansing wave, hymn number two two seven. If you need it, let's stand together and we'll sing this hymn tonight. together for a word of prayer. Father, thank you for salvation, for the cleansing that we have um, because of Christ. I pray, Lord, that we would live every day in light of the gospel, uh, never basing um, the things of life on our good works and uh, our merit, but always remembering that it's a free gift. And uh, Lord, the reason why we can even live the Christian life is because of your grace and through faith. Lord, I pray that you would now help us as we focus our attention on your word tonight. Um, Lord, we need to hear from you again. Um, It's not just enough that we hear it, though. We need to be doers of the word. So I pray, Lord, that you would give us not just a hearing heart, but a responding heart tonight. Uh, May we not leave here with unfinished business. May we deal with you as you deal with us. I pray that you'd help Brother Gleister as he preaches, give him wisdom, clarity of thought, And Lord, may you say exactly what we need to hear tonight. And we'll give you the glory for all these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Amen. Again, good welcome, welcome, welcome. We're glad to have you. Glad to have a couple of our teens with us here tonight. Thank you for being here. And really thank all of you for being here. We're grateful for those that are watching at home. And uh, we trust that tonight will be a blessing as the previous evenings have been as well. Anybody remember last night's message? What was last night all about? Anybody remember anything about last night? Let's start with the basic there. What was it about? Prayer. Amen. It was about prayer. And uh, what, what about prayer? What did we learn about prayer there real fast? Just uh, I always like review. They say review is the teacher's best, uh, best tool here. So real quick, what was it about last night with regard to prayer? Okay, expectation, right? I, I think if we pray and we don't have any expectation, what are we really praying? What are we asking God to do? Okay, so praying with expectation, good, good. Something else? Yes, with thanksgiving. Okay, so we're going to get into the maybe some of the different kinds of prayers. All right, very good. There were a couple things that really jumped out with me. Uh, we're, we're around it, but we're not on it yet here. What are we really to pray? Let's do this. Um, anybody remember any of the characters that were involved in that uh, stu- study last night? The two individuals that were mentioned by way of our study? Uh, okay, well, they were certainly mentioned by way of the gospel. Okay, right, it's out of the gospel of. Anybody remember what gospel that would be then? Very good. It was Mark chapter 5. Very good. Okay, somebody else is going to say something. Uh, those two were mentioned as far as how Mark ended up writing, uh, you know, at uh, certainly led of the Holy Spirit. Peter certainly influenced there. But good, there were two individuals in the story that he shared with us last night, and they were 
Jairus and the woman uh, had the, blood, the issue of blood for 12 years. And, and really, what, what, what was the parallel between both of those individuals? Because that's the key. That's the crux. What was, well, I think they both really had faith. They both really demonstrated faith. Yep, they did that. Uh, but I think there's something really, again, that was characteristic of both those individuals. They were, yes, desperate is the word I'm hearing, desperate. They really, they didn't really care what other people thought. Uh, they didn't care who was in their way. They wanted to get to the Lord. They wanted to get to the Lord, and they were desperate. How desperate are you to talk to God? How desperate are you? And so I don't know about you, but it certainly resonated with me. I want to be desperate to talk to God about some very important issues. And by the way, both of those issues were critical issues. The lady that spent her whole livelihood on trying to get cured, just couldn't, but she knew that Christ had that ability. And then Jairus, uh, daughter's dying. I mean, who, who wouldn't go to the extreme measures to, to find any help you could get for your daughter? So that was powerful. They were both desperate. And the question that you know I walked away with her, just how desperate am I to really talk to God about certain issues? Anyway, I don't know about you, but that, that connected with me. And here's the important, as I think Pastor Josh already prayed, May God help us to be doers of the word. We didn't just come to have our ears and our minds filled with a truth that is important. No, hey, listen, based on that, I want to I want to demonstrate a, a real desperate desire to talk to God about really critical things. And so I hope and pray that uh, that will be your heart's desire as well. Uh, that would that would really be good. His his points were certainly the wideness of God's mercy and the wonder of his might. They were the two points that were mentioned in it, but the, the long and short of the whole message was, hey, listen, I, I hope that you get desperate about the things of God. That's really good. Hey, we're glad to have you back. You want to come back again tomorrow night? Should we keep him here again another night? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, brother. Cancel your flight. You are staying. Actually, snow's coming in. I'll tell you, I think they're shutting down all flights out of Newark here. So. <laughs> He's already been on the road for a couple weeks here, so please, I want to get back and see my wife. I want to <laughs> get back. So, uh, but it's been good. We're grateful that the Lord brought Brother Gleiser with us here this uh, this week, and and so thankful. So, nope, there's no more meetings this week here. The, uh, the next big thing is Sunday morning, and Sunday morning we'd like to do the Lord's Table Sunday morning. Anybody know what Sunday? The date of Sunday is Sunday is. Uh, yes, this lady over here knows. She's already counting it. Huh? She's looking at it. It is February 14th. Anybody know what February 14th is? Yes, and Valentine's is all about love, right? So we're going to talk really about the Lord's table. It's a great day to talk about the love of Christ that was demonstrated for us there at the cross. So we're going to observe the Lord's table on Sunday morning. And so, again, for you that are watching, I hope that you'll be here with us. We have not observed the Lord's table uh, but every couple of months or so. And so, Lord willing, Sunday we're going to do that in the morning service. And by the way, I want to say uh, this, was a, this was a trial run for us by way of this meeting this week. Do you realize we have not had a week of meetings for over a year? We've had Sunday meetings, lots of those, but we have not met on a Monday or a Tuesday or from Sunday through Wednesday uh, for over a year. And that is just not characteristic of us. We have had lots of those meetings in the course of a year. And uh, because of COVID, they were all kind of shut down a little bit. So this was something special. This is the first time that we've been able to meet. And so I remember even talking with Brother Gleiser back in November. Are you having it? Is it going to go? And it's like, yeah, we're going to try to make it go. But the Lord had other plans in November. And then we were talking about the same thing. How's it going to go in, uh, in February? And said, nope, we're going to, by God's grace, plow through. And I'm happy we did. So thank you for coming, Brother. It truly has been a joy and a delight. All right, we're going to take our hymn books and we're going to turn to hymn number 160, Channels Only. How I praise thee, precious Savior, that thy love laid hold of me. Thou hast saved and cleansed and filled me, that I might thy channel. Verse number two is really a revival verse. Look at it with me. 
emptied that thou shouldest fill me. That's pretty interesting. You have to be empty in order to be filled. Emptied of self, so they can be filled with his spirit. A clean vessel in thy hand, with no power as thou givest graciously with each command. When we're emptied of self and filled with the spirit, God has things for us to do. But he doesn't ask us to do them in our power. Because we don't have any power. He says, the power as you give me. And with that power that you give me, I can carry forth your command. It's really a revival verse. Let's sing it together. Verse number two. Empty that thou shouldest fill me a clean vessel in thy hand. stand one more time. We're going to sing our theme song for this revival meeting one last time in preparation for the message tonight, A Tender Heart. Let's sing it with me. We'll sing all three verses tonight.
thank you for your singing. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Josh, for leading us in song here tonight. Well, we're glad to have all of you with us tonight. The Monday family is going to come and minister by way of a special number at this time. They're going to sing a song entitled Shepherd of My Soul. Hey, real quick, before they come, what do you think about a shepherd? What does a shepherd do? What does a shepherd do? I know we don't live uh, in that realm, but we know enough about a shepherd that we could be able to think a thought or two. What does a shepherd do? Okay, they take care of his flock. And exactly how do they take care of their flock? They do take care of the flock. They do that by way of? I didn't quite get all that here. So be the loudest. <laughs> they protect their sheep. Very good. I like that. They protect their sheep. Very good. Somebody else? Somebody, uh, okay, so they watch over them. The idea of protecting, watching over. Good. They lead. They feed. They protect. This is what shepherds do for their sheep. They're going to sing a song entitled, Shepherd of My Soul. He wants to lead us. He wants to feed us. He protects us. He watches over us. I don't know if those are the words of the song, but I know that that's what a shepherd does, and they'll bring in maybe a different aspect of it, but I trust that this will be a blessing to you as they minister to us. Lord bless you. grateful that we have a wonderful shepherd for our soul. Praise God. Well, we want that shepherd to speak to us here tonight. We want God to really challenge us anew and afresh. I hope and pray it's not just another service or the last service of a week of meetings. I pray tonight will be just as fresh as it was Sunday morning with great expectation, great anticipation of what God was going to do. I hope and pray God has worked in your heart. I know he's worked in my heart, and uh, we're looking forward to what he's going to do here tonight. 
So, brother, thank you for being here with us. Thank you for your ministry all week, and God bless you as you minister one more time. Thank you, sir. It's thank you. You've, you've been a joy as well. Well, he said exactly what I prayed for when I left, uh, uh, when I was praying and, and getting my heart ready in my room. I said, Lord, don't let this just be another service. Don't let us just kind of go through the routine, the motions of having another time together or a Wednesday night service and, and, uh, and the conclusion, concluding service. And I, uh, I prayed that it would be fresh. And so he said exactly, he and I are on the same page. I'm glad you're here tonight. Thank you for coming. I, uh, I, uh, I teased with uh, one or two tonight about uh, them being here, and I haven't seen them. I uh, didn't, didn't meet them yet, and uh, they weren't here for whatever various reason. They were not able to be here for other services. We're glad you're here, and we're glad. If you came tonight not knowing that the church is having a revival meeting, uh, where have you been? Uh, I'm sure it was announced beforehand, although with COVID and weather and everything else, maybe there was some real questions as to whether or not you were going to be able to do it. Glad It's been such a joy to be here. I mean this with all my heart. I talk to my wife, of course, uh, more than once every day, and, and I've, uh, she, she always, her heart is always wherever I'm located, wherever I'm preaching. If I, most of the time she's there, but certainly during a week like this when we're not together and um, she wanted to know uh, about the church and about the meeting, and I said, this is a special place. It really is. I have been treated far too kindly, and I have... Uh, and thoroughly enjoyed myself. I just wish your pastor would kind of come out of his shell, don't you? I mean, he's just, he's just not real effervescent. And uh, uh, I believe a hurricane could come through here, and a tornado, and an earthquake, and a mudslide. He'd say, it's a beautiful day, isn't it? It's just, there's something good out there that's going on. And uh, I am grateful for that spirit. You need to be thankful for that. Honestly, you do. And you need to be much in prayer. Because that doesn't mean he doesn't carry a load, and I don't want to start chasing a rabbit, but I know you pray for your pastor. I hope that you do. And pray for both your pastors. These are great people, and I'm so grateful for them. I want to say thanks to Brother Josh for all of his ministry to me privately and personally, and then the leading in music, and to, uh, to Pastor Brown and Mrs. Brown. They've been so kind. These dear people have put up with my voice since the couples retreat uh, a few days ago, and uh, I've got to leave because I've run out of things to say. And uh, for them, not really. But the truth is, I, I know they've heard my voice so many times. And some of you have been here for every single service. And I'm deeply appreciative. And I uh, thank you for uh, giving your heart over to the Lord. I really am thankful for that. If we have not met yet, uh, when I am finished, hope to meet you before you walk out the door. And uh, get a chance to say howdy to you. And uh, if you would, pray for me. I do leave tomorrow. be making my way that back to the south. I will fly to Atlanta, pick up my car, and then start driving home to Dallas. And so uh, I've got a little bit of a journey tomorrow. And uh, I will probably certainly not make the entire drive tomorrow, although I would love to. I hope to, depending on the uh, energy, strength and traffic and all like that. Anyway, nevertheless, pray for me if you would, and I greatly would appreciate that very much. I hope our paths will cross again, and I look forward to seeing you again, and you can remind me, and you say, hey, uh, we, we met in, in, in uh, downtown New Jersey, and I'll say, yeah, okay, I remember you well. I hope we will see each other. I believe the Lord's coming again, don't you? I believe he's coming back maybe even tonight. Wouldn't that be a joy? I hope you're ready for that. Hope that you're ready for his return. Not only that you know him as Savior, but that you're ready to face him and to see him and to uh, greet him with your, your heart prepared to say, I did what I could in service to you. With that in mind, would you take your Bible and turn to the book of Romans tonight and turn to chapter 12, Romans chapter 12. Let me thank uh, the Mondays for that wonderful truth of song. I thank you so much for that. I, I'm delighted just to see the family up here singing. And uh, it's always a special treat to see a family doing something like that. Romans chapter 12. Now, when you get there, if you'll just simply glance at the first verse, or some of you who are already familiar with Romans 12 will already know, oh, yeah, this is a very familiar passage. Certainly it is. In fact, I can remember, honestly, when I was a young person, about 11 years of age, when uh, I, uh, I was challenged to memorize the entire chapter of Romans 12. And I did. I learned it. 
And uh, it was a challenge at church, and I received some books as a gift for it. It's a great chapter. It's a chapter that reveals a lot of practical truths for the Christian life. But as I often try to do before I start reading a text, I like to lay a groundwork and a foundation as to what leads into what we're about to read. I think that's important to know. Paul, the human author of this letter to the church at Rome, as he always did, he always, in all of his writings, lays a foundation of, let me throw a, a theological term, a, a Bible term at you, doctrine. Now, don't let that word sound dry and dusty to you. Don't yawn at the word and say, oh, doctrine. No, 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 doctrine is rich. Doctrine is, is just is incredibly vitally important to the stability of our, of our spiritual life. Paul always lays the foundation of doctrine, but he never stops with the doctrine. He says, because this is true, this is how it ought be lived out and fleshed out in your life. And I think that's healthy. Most of the letters are pretty evenly divided. Foundation of theological teaching and doctrine and then teaching of practical outgrowth. Am I losing anybody yet? I hope not. Our friends watching online are those of you here in this room. But when you come to the letter to the church at Rome, there's a whole lot of doctrine. We, Paul, of course, didn't write with chapter divisions, but we have it divided in these chapters it is the entire first 11 chapters. And as you know, uh, the book doesn't go much further uh, after that. The first 11 chapters are the doctrinal chapters. And then <coughs> he turns in chapter 12 and he gets practical. Now, that does not mean that tonight I don't want to do any teaching, that I don't want to do any doctrinal uh, explanation, because there will be. But I want you to understand the reason for the fourth word in verse 1. Look at the fourth word in verse 1. It's the word, therefore. Actually, you could put that at the very beginning of the sentence. It's as if Paul is saying, because of everything I have tried to teach you. Now, what did he teach? He taught that we're all wicked-hearted, depraved, sinful individuals and in desperate need of a Savior. Have you ever won somebody to Jesus Christ? If you have, you've probably turned to the book of Romans. Because in the book of Romans, you show a person, and I hope that if you need this tonight, you're listening, we're all sinners, all of us. The best of us are nothing but in the eyes and the heart of the face of God, filthy rags. We're sinful creatures, and we're in desperate need of someone to save our soul. And the only one who could is Jesus, the Son of God. And he begins to tell us how that we have a Savior. For all have sinned, and we all fall short, come short of the glory of God. Because the wages of sin leads to death. Death means separation. The wages of sin is death. We're separated from God. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Not through a church, not through getting baptized, not through giving money to good causes, but through Jesus Christ our Lord. I hope that you've accepted him as your Savior and only him and not trusted anything that you could do. It's all been done for you. And Paul goes on to describe that the gospel was given to Israel and then it's been given to the Gentiles. And as far as I know, that would include the majority of us in this room. And, he, he, and I say amen to the fact that it was presented to all of humanity that Christ died for us. And then he comes to what we call chapter 12. And he says, therefore. Because all that's true, therefore. I mean, is it just head knowledge? No, no, no. It needs to be applied to our life. Let's read it. Beginning in verse 1. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. Okay, so he's talking to believers. Brethren, by or because of the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. 
I could preach the entire night on that one verse. And be not conformed, pressed into a mold, to this world, this age, this cultural age, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me. Now, who's, who's writing this? It's Paul. So Paul's talking about himself. He says, I'm writing this through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let's prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. In the 1800s, in the latter 1800s, many of you have ever, I've probably heard of the famous British pastor, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Uh, he's just, he was just a classic preacher. Charles Spurgeon told a story of one day going to visit an elderly lady that was uh, in his uh, church family. And, uh, and the reason why was because she was nearing maybe the end of her life. She was, uh, she was weak. She was poor. And uh, she was living in a portion of town, a section of, of London that was really uh, where a lot of poor people lived. And she didn't have much. But uh, she loved the Lord. She came to church. And Charles Spurgeon, her pastor, went to see her. And Spurgeon talked about how he walked into that simple little house he said it didn't have but just about two rooms, the, the front living area where everything of her life was, and then a kitchen and uh, dining area was in the back part. And they sat and they talked, and he said, how goes it with you, ma'am? And they chatted for a while and enjoyed time together. And then he said at some moment there was a pause in conversation, and she was, again, weak, and, and uh, he was trying to encourage her. And he looked over at the wall, the bare wall, except up on the wall there was one framed image. It wasn't a picture. It was some kind of certificate. Well, curiosity got the best of him, and Spurgeon said he stood up and walked over and began to look at it, and he began to read the writing on the certificate. It was a beautifully designed certificate. He turned around and he said, Madam, did you ever know a man by the name of, now I've got to make up a, a name because I don't remember the actual name, uh, George Williams? Oh, she said, yes, of course, Pastor, I remember him. I knew him years ago, she said. She said, uh, when he was uh, much, uh, you know, nearing the much older man than I, and, and, uh, and she said, I used to, when I had physical strength, I used to go by and, and, uh, and my, one of my, uh, kind of my jobs was to kind of help, help people in need like that. And she said, I would go to his house and, and uh, I would prepare a meal for him and I would comfort him and I'd take a blanket and cover him up when it was that time for his afternoon nap. And I would just, she said, he didn't have any family. And, and she said, I would go there and just uh, talk with him and encourage him as best I could and take care of him. And she, and she said, now, Pastor, why do you bring up George Williams? I don't understand. He said, Madam, have you ever read this certificate? Oh, she said, Pastor, you know I can't read. She said, I'm illiterate. And she said, she said, it just showed up here one day. And she said, I just thought it looked so nice and beautiful decorations on it. I found that old beat up frame and put it in the frame. I just needed something on the wall. I put it up on the wall just to have something colorful and attractive up on the wall. She goes, no. She goes, is his name on that certificate? He said, Madam, what, was he a wealthy man? Oh, she said, yeah. oh, she said, his house was huge. She said, very wealthy. And uh, she said, uh, it was just in a massive uh, uh, structure that he lived in, absolutely, all by himself, didn't have family. He said, madam, 
when he died, he left everything to you. And you live here. She said, Pastor, what are you talking about? He said, Madam, legally, he left you all of his wealth, all of his estate. It belongs to you. I suppose because it was a different time, nobody was able to, some lawyer wasn't able to find her, and they found out eventually but from, a, from a local bank or legal people, they found out who it was that could take care of her, and they said, we've always wondered where she was. I have two thoughts about this. Number one, why, didn't that ever, why doesn't that ever happen to me? I mean, you know what I mean? Really, I mean, can you believe that? And then second of all, can you imagine the loss of what she had been living with and under the conditions she had been living under, and yet she owned so much more? Now, can I multiply that so many times over to tell you now you understand why Paul is beseeching us. The word beseech in verse 1 is the idea of urgency. Get the picture of this man on his knees, grabbing believers by the lapels of their jackets and shirts, and he says, I am pleading with you to hear me. I urge you. I wish some of you had never heard these words before, although I'm glad you have. But I would, I would every one of us tonight to hear with brand new, fresh hearing tonight that the word of God through his man Paul is saying to us, listen to me, God has gifted you with giftings that makes you a unique creation of God for what purpose? For his glory and your good. Did you know that I'm as convinced as I can be that across the country and probably certainly across the globe, there are good people who attend church, but they become an audience rather than an army of soldiers to serve the Lord with what God has gifted them with. I've been so grateful for the sweet spirit among this church family at Kendall Park. But can I say to you, every one of us tonight need to take a little survey and find out, wait a minute, wait a minute, what have I been given what is it that God has gifted me with? Now listen, we've been singing uh, a tender heart every night, every service we've been singing it. And it says in the, in the song, all my talents I surrender. And it says, Lord, while I have a tender heart, I give it all to you. Now the word talents sometimes can throw us off with the word that we're looking at tonight. You know, there are unsaved people. There are people who don't know the Lord Jesus who have talents. They play ball, they play sports, they play musical instruments, they have brains of, of a business sense, they have the ability in the professional world, in the medical world, in the legal world. Listen, there are people who have talents, but we're not talking about talents as such. Now, your personal talents may be married to your gifts, but we're talking about spiritual giftings. I like the word giftings. I mean, can I just tell you what it is? Listen carefully. What, Bi what the Bible is trying to say to us, and I'm going somewhere. Here's what the Bible is saying. He's talking about a unique ability. Listen to this. A unique ability for service unto God that God has given to every true Christian that he or she did not possess before they became a Christian. Did you hear that? It is a unique ability given by God for service unto God to every true Christian, given to every true Christian that he or she did not possess beforehand. That's what Paul is saying. He's saying because you've gotten saved, because of the Spirit of God that's moved inside of you, you've been gifted. And here's what I think he's saying. Don't waste your life. I'm telling you, friends, I have... I have uh, tried with all of my heart, certainly in the last few years, to recognize the brevity of life and to understand we, you don't, what I've been given from God is something that I am to manage. It is a gift. Are you hearing this? It doesn't belong to me. It belongs to my master. And I am going to be held accountable for the way in which I have lived my life. 
Sometimes, I, sometimes, and I don't know you, I don't know you well enough to be able, I'm not trying to uh, uh, cast dispersion on anybody here, but sometimes people just come, they sit, they soak it all up, and they get up and they walk out, and nothing ever changes, and they don't affect anybody. Listen, we are not just to attend church. Catch this, we are to affect the church. Sometimes we get a little touchy. I'm against everything. Well, something comes up for a vote in the church. I think, you know, someone says, I think we need to change the, I don't know, the rafters. I don't think you need to. I'm just trying to make up something. We're going to change the light bulbs from white to uh, green. Okay, I'm just thinking, and you know, no, I wouldn't be for that either. But I mean, uh, uh, you, know, you know, change a carpet and change a hymn book and change a, uh, uh, whatever the case may be. And somebody will say, oh, 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 no, no, I'm against it. Well, why? I, I'm just, I just don't like any changes. Now, look, there's a place for anybody to bring up uh, their own thoughts. But here's the deal. Sometimes we get a little touchy about things. Listen, listen, we ought not be touchy. We ought to be touching lives. We ought to be affecting life change. I'm all for giving offerings. I thank the Lord for a church that gives offerings. But you know what? The Bible is teaching us here that we ought to be giving our lives as an offering for service unto the Lord. That's all I'm trying to say tonight. And here's what the Bible is saying. It's saying present your bodies. And then it says in verse 2, let your mind be renewed. So he's talking about your human body and your mind. Let it be continually presented to God for what purpose? For service unto the Lord. Can I just give you uh, some foundational truths and then we're going to break some things down. Do you, know, do you know if you're doing and fulfilling what God has gifted you to be? You've been gifted. Uh, look, I'm not an artist. I'm not an artist by any stretch. Uh, they tell us that there are three primary colors. You remember learning that? What was it in third grade? Three primary colors. And what are they? Red, uh, blue, and yellow. And all other colors come from a mixture of some shading of those three primary colors. Okay, all right. In the end of this portion that I read to you tonight, verses 6 to 8, I read some of the giftings. This is not an exhaustive list of the gifts that God has given to his people. Now, I'm going somewhere. Here's what he's saying. He, there's also another gift set of gifts in 1 Corinthians 12. Study it sometime. There's another set of gifts in Ephesians 4 where it speaks of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. The apostle Peter actually divided all the gifts into two groupings, speaking gifts and serving gifts. Parenthetically, let me say this. That does not mean when someone who has a speaking gift that they should never be involved with serving. I mean, in getting their hands involved with serving. It also doesn't mean that if you've been gifted and you, you're more inclined to be in the serving gifts, that you ought not ever give a testimony or teach a Sunday school class or actually uh, speak somewhere along the way. It doesn't mean that. It just means that there's a particular leaning. Here's what I'm trying to say. God will take these giftings like an artist. You ever, you ever seen that guy on TV on public broadcasting system? He's got hair from here to Albuquerque. And, and, he, and, he, and he takes, he, and he whispers when he talks. You know. What's his name? Bob Ross, is that it? And he, and he stands in front. Don't, don't look at me like you know what I'm talking about. And he, and he stands there and he, and he, takes, a little, he takes a little bit of these pictures, uh, uh, colors, and he says, oh, okay, we'll just design a little bit this here. And we'll just we'll put all this right here. And we'll just take all this right here and so forth. And I can't hardly hear him. And, uh, and he's, he's designed all this. And finally, at the end of the program, they back up and they show this beautiful picture of, of trees and a river and a mountain and a forest glade and all this. Now look, look, what's he done? This talented artist has taken a combination of colors and designed this beautiful picture. The greatest designer of all takes all these gifts. We read this list and we say, well, I must have the gift of, and you name one gift. No, 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 no. You and I are distinct creations of God. God in his unique ability took those giftings and he says, we're going to take a little bit of this, take a little bit of that, and then we'll put this together and put this together here and I'll produce uh, Mike Brown and I'll produce Morris Gleiser and you can put your name there. God says, I'm going to make you a distinct creation. For what purpose? For ministry, for the glory of God. Don't waste your life. Foundationally, let me just say this. None of us in this room, hear me, none of you in this room need to say, I'm just, I'm not very good at anything, preacher man. I'm, I'm, I'm not very 
talented. We're not talking about talents. You say, well, I'm just not capable of doing anything, you know. Maybe when I was at a certain age or something, I, you know, I can't, even, I can't even lead in silent prayer. I mean, I'm just kind of, uh, I'm just incapable. No, what you've got is poor posture. Stand up and realize who you are in Jesus Christ. Look at what Paul said here. Look, what is it? Verse 6, he says this. Having this, look at it. Having then gifts differing according to the grace given to us. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. It's verse 5. Verse 5. So we, he's talking about the church, being many, there's a lot of us. We are one body in Christ. Look at this. And every one of us members one of another. What's he saying? He's saying just like the human body has various uh, uh, portions of the human body, and we need every one of them. And the fact of the matter is, he's saying there, we need you. Kendall Park Baptist needs you. This area needs you. And the fact of the matter is, the church is only as healthy as it's each individual. Individual believers are spiritually healthy who can do more than just sing the words on a song that simply says, God, I give you my life. My heart is tender. Please use me for your glory. I give you my life. We don't, don't minimize what God's done. You're a distinct creation. Secondly, don't maximize who you are. Don't act like, yeah. You know, kind of get that Barney Fife proud look. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably about the best person in this church. What does it say there in verse 3? He said, let every one of you not... He said, let me get it exactly. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. You know, uh, he talks about the human body. I know it's a bit silly, but it would be a bit silly if the fingers started saying to the ears, you know, I, I work a lot better than you do. I, I do a whole lot more than you do. And the ear says, well, what are you talking about? Uh, I mean, I, I mean, the, you may not see a lot of movement out of me, but you need me. Again, forgive the silliness, but he's talking about the human body. And nobody can see my liver, nobody can see uh, uh, my pancreas, but I'm glad they're there, you know, and I hope they're doing what they're supposed to do, do that liver work and pancreatic work, you know, and all that stuff. Why? Because we need it all, and we need you. But don't, don't act like, you know, this church is better off because I'm here. I don't know that that spirit is in this church, but don't ever let it creep into your life. Don't minimize yourself, don't maximize yourself, and then don't misplace your giftedness. What does that mean? Don't try to be something that you're not. I, I can only give you an example from my own life. I mean, there are times in which I've heard other preachers preach, and I think, I want to preach like that guy. I want to preach like that and I can't. And I'm not supposed to. I'm not supposed, I'm not supposed to be like somebody else. I hear somebody that just breaks open a passage of Scripture, and they're just gifted with teaching. And I go, oh, Man, I love that. I love good teaching. And I try to teach. All preaching, all preaching includes teaching. But some people just, I mean, that is their ability in, 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 uh, in, on steroids. I mean, it's a big thing. And you know what I'm talking about. But I can't be like somebody else. i got to be me. And you got to be you. And the church needs you. So what are we supposed to do? You say, Morris, you're getting all worked up. What's this got to do with me? All right, first of all, you need to pursue your gifting. You say, what do you mean? Discover it. That's exactly what he's saying. This is not just for young people. Paul didn't write just to teenagers when he wrote this. He's writing to the entire church family, and he says, I plead with you. Look at verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, meaning because you've accepted Christ as your Savior, that you present your bodies a sacrifice that is alive, a living sacrifice, holy, that is a purified life, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. The word reasonable means logical. It's a, uh, uh, it's a word that means it is, it is what you are supposed to be, your logical ministry. Present your bodies. Why? Uh, it says in verse 2, And don't be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may be able to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Can I just pause on that word acceptable? The word acceptable is a word that means pleasing. 
You know, we say something that if someone says, uh, uh, you know, you take, a, uh, you take a bite of something and you go, is that good? Uh, yeah, it's acceptable. You know, it sounds kind of low grade. No, no, no. The word acceptable here is pleasing. To whom is the, is the will of God pleasing? I'm going to tell you who it is. To yourself. It's like, this is the greatest thing in the world. I get to serve God. When a, the, the, if you want to live life to the max, find out exactly what God want, has gifted you to be and to do, and then live that the rest of your life, however long it is. Don't waste your life. Pursue God's giftings. You say, okay, Gleiser, how do I do that? Well, he just told you. How? Present your body. Can I tell you that he's talking to brethren? So that, can I break it down into steps? It's one step at a time. Step number one, here's how I'm going to discern what God has gifted me to be and to do. Step number one, I get saved. You know, he's talking to brethren. I repeat, if you need Jesus as your Savior tonight, that's the first step that needs to be taken. Then the second step is the word sanctification. What's that? Well, presenting your body. The word sanctification means to be set apart unto God. It's like, uh, it's like these chairs have been set apart from you. And, 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 and it's the idea of, God, I give my life. I'm not just lost in the maze of humanity. I am right in here, right now, saying to you, here's my life. You can do anything you want to with me. I belong to you, not to me. Have you ever done that? Here's the problem. We live in a day in which we let the world dictate our identity, what I'm going to be. We, we try to find out through commercials and, and advertisements and people around us, and we let them dictate uh, what we're supposed to be. Or in the days in which we've lived, you have uh, kind of a rebellious spirit, although that's probably not the right word for it. We have more of a spirit that says, no one's going to tell me what to do, brother. I am going to be my own person, and I'm going to choose what I want to do, and that preacher can carry on all he wants to up there, but I'm just going to do what I want to do. This is the way in which I'm going to live. It's the way I've always lived. This is it, and I'm not going to conform to commercials or to preachers or anybody else. This is me. When the truth of the matter is, the Bible is saying here, we're to have a gospel, Christ-honoring identity that says, I don't own myself. I belong to you. Have you ever come to him and said, I give you my life? You say, yeah, I got saved. I'm glad. I'm talking about the day-to-day -day sanctification, pursuit of holiness. God, I want to be more like you so that I can do what you want me to do and to be what you want me to be. Can I give you some Bible examples? You remember a young man in the Bible by the name of Samuel? He heard at night, back when, they, when God spoke without the word of God, they, they, he, had, he heard an audible voice. Samuel, Samuel, what did he say? Speak, Lord, you're my Lord, and I'm your servant. Your servant hears. What do you want me to do? And God called Samuel to be his prophet. Do you remember a teenage girl by the name of Mary? We talk about her every Christmas season. An angel came to her and said, you're going to be the mother of the Messiah. You go read what she said in Luke 1 and verse 38. Here's what she said. Behold, the handmaid of the Lord. What was she saying? I'm yours. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'm the handmaid of the Lord. The very man who's writing this, when he got converted... On the road to Damascus, he asked two questions. Who are you, Lord? And then, right on the coattails, he said, what will you have me to do? I mean, Paul didn't drag his feet. He got right with it. And I mean, he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Now, did God tell Paul everything? In fact, he was a Saul at that time. Did he tell him everything he was going to do? No. He just said, well, just get up. You're, you're going to be blind for about three days, but you're going to get up. And uh, he actually didn't even tell him three days. He said, get up. He said, and go to Damascus. He just led him to the next location and wait there. Can you imagine him sitting there in Damascus with blindness and darkness and wondering as he meditated on, that was Jesus that I saw, <laughs> the one that I've been trying to, to get rid of all, the, all those who follow him. This is, I mean, and then all of a sudden, he, he, the blinders came off when a believer came in and prayed over him. And the truth is, Paul, Saul became Paul. God didn't tell him everything. He just was led one step at a time. Why? Because Paul said, what do you want me to do? Have you ever done that? You say, Mr. Preacher, I'm not in the ministry. 
Pardon me? You say, well, I'm a businessman. I'm a housewife. My plate's full. I'm a young person. I got, I'm just trying to get through school. I got high school. I got college. I got, I, I'm retired. I got to. God's people are all in the ministry. God's gifted you, man. Don't minimize. We need you. Find out what it is God has gifted you to be and to do for his glory. How do you find it? Whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. Can I tell you? He'll begin to show you. I'm going to say more things about it in a moment. Uh, can you imagine? Look, suppose, uh, suppose uh, this card up here represents uh, the, the gifting in my life. And let's suppose I'm a young man or even an adult man, and I don't, I don't know what God has put inside of me. And you're sitting here tonight and you're saying, Mr. Preacher, I don't, I don't know. I mean, you, I don't, I know what, what God's gifted me to be. I, I'm kind of lost. And it's, it's suppose I don't, I don't see what he wants me to do or to be. And I go to him and I say, okay, Lord, I present my body and my mind to you. I'll, I'll, I'll be whatever you want me to be. I'll do it. And what happens is God begins to, little by little, begin to show you things that he wants you to do. He opens some doors. And you'll find yourself leaning towards certain interests. You'll find yourself enjoying certain things. And as time goes by, you'll find yourself saying, I really enjoy this. Here's the, here's the deal. When I was a young man, I said to the Lord, Lord, I'll do anything you want me to do. I, I, don't, I, said, I said, I'm not scared to trust you. Sometimes I get a little nervous, but Lord, I give you my life. And things began to happen. I remember when I was probably 18, 19 years of age. I forget how old it was. We were having vacation Bible school. You know about that. And uh, there were some ladies, that, two ladies that were working with, uh, I think, little uh, 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 eight and nine-year-old uh, uh, kids, third and fourth grade kids. And they came up to me at church and they said, Morris, during VBS, we would like for you <laughs> to speak to our third and fourth grade kids at VBS. I said, do what? They said, we want you to speak to the third and fourth grade kids. I said, they're like pre-people. They're not even, they're not even uh, real, are they? I said, what in the world? And they said, you, you can do it. I said, I've never done anything like that in my life. You talk about sweating bullets. Man, I prayed, and I probably should have fasted. I mean, I was just thinking, what in the world? What am I going to do? I can, tell you, I can tell you tonight what I spoke on, craziest thing in the world. I, sp I spoke on Balaam and his talking donkey. I thought, well, that, that may be uh, something they could, I could teach them on. You better do what God tells you to do, you know. And uh, uh, those of you who play the instruments so well that you're going to get nervous about this. But I grabbed a piano bench and I made it my donkey. I thought, I gotta, how am I going to keep these kids' attention, you know. I can't just stand up here and kind of drone on. I gotta, it, it really helped me to kind of break out of my comfort zone and to, and to get people to pay attention. And so I grabbed that bench and I literally... I. I, I just kind of rode that piano bench in front of those kids. They were looking at me like we don't have a normal person here in this room. And then I got down on the floor and I looked up like I was uh, talking like the donkey and I talked to Balaam and then I jumped back up and I was Balaam uh, talking to the donkey and I got back down and I kept their attention. I don't remember all that I was trying to teach. When I got through, I said that was absolutely, it'll go down in history as the absolute worst teaching that kids have ever heard in their life. And I tried to act calm and everything, but I couldn't wait till that door opened and I could get out of that room. And when I finally got out, I started walking to my car as fast as I could, and one of those teachers chased me down in the parking lot. And she said, Morris, Morris. And I thought, she's going to come yell at me on the parking lot. I, I, I can't believe this. And I thought, she's going to conduct church discipline and tell me to never come back again, you know. And she stopped me, and she said, that was really good. I thought, the poor lady, she's lost her mind. I'm telling you. I said, are you serious? And she said, would you come back and speak again on Thursday? I said, are you serious? She said, very. So I did. Went off to college. I began to be asked to speak and give a devotional here. And we'd, go to a, we'd go to a county jail and witness to men in jail, and I would be asked to speak to them and give a challenge in that place. And then I'd go to a nursing home, and I'd be asked to speak, and then I'd give another devotional over here. You know what I found myself doing? I found myself kind of enjoying it. I began to see something happening inside of me that I was kind of enjoying. I found myself saying, now, Lord, 
what are you doing? Uh, here I am studying medicine, and I don't know what you want me to do. I said, you're opening these doors, and I'm kind of enjoying it. Now, Lord, you, you better stop this. If you don't want me to preach, if you don't want me to be someone proclaiming your word, you better stop this, okay? So hurry up and stop it. And then I get asked again. I enjoy that, and I get asked again. I said, now, Lord, please. And finally, I said, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm going to go. I'm going to do it. And if it's not what I'm supposed to do, <laughs> it's not my fault. Well, how silly of that childish brain of mine. Truth is, God put the desire in my heart, and then he let me fulfill it. You know, that's what I'm trying still to do after all these years. I'm just trying to live life to the max, doing what God put inside my heart years ago. Have you ever said, Lord, I just want to know what you want me to do and what you want me to be? How can I better improve the work of God here at Kendall Park? How can I make a difference in the world in which I live in? Oh, God, use me. Pursue God's giftings. Number two, protect God's giftings. Protect them. You say, what do you mean? Look at verse 2. What does he say? He says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may approve, prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What is he saying? He says, don't let the world force you to do what they tell you to do. You be what God wants you to do. And he breaks it down here in the next few verses. But he's saying here, protect God's giftings. Don't waste your life. Look, he's saying, don't let the world influence you and pull you into some conformity of thought that's contrary to God's will. So what does that mean? Well, it means this. Our life is to be comprised of a holy pursuit of Christ-likeness, a wholehearted desire to be more like Him. We call it sanctification. Look, salvation began... And there was, a, there, there was the, the salvation that, that took place when we accepted Christ as Savior. There will be a perfected salvation when we go to heaven, when we're in glory. And we'll be in a place of perfected salvation. But between the two places, there is this season of time in which we are progressively moving toward more and more Christ-likeness unless we get distracted and we get off the trail and we let something get our attention, let me put it on the bottom shelf. Does it really matter what we choose for entertainment? Does it really matter what we watch on television? Does it really matter who our friends are? Does it really matter how we live? Does it really matter if, um, if uh, we're faithful to the work of God, the house of God? The word of God, does it, really, does it really matter if we're seeking to honor him? Does it matter? And you know the answer because some of you have been saying it. The answer is quick and, and it's volume full. Yes. You don't want to waste what God's given you. There was a guy named Samson. Never heard of him? God greatly used him until he continued to get distracted with the things of this world. And I guess you could argue that his life was snuffed out kind of early. He didn't protect what God had gifted him to be and to do. There was a guy who traveled with the Apostle Paul, and I don't know what his responsibilities were. Maybe he, maybe he helped gather the crowds. Maybe he even taught from time to time. Maybe he did other things. I don't know. His name was Demas. And at some point, Paul had to say, you know, Demas is no longer with us. He loves this present world. Abraham, the father of Israel, had a nephew that he loved and had taught and had influenced by the name of Lot. He looked over at Sodom and Gomorrah and said, I'd kind of like to get a little bit closer to that city over there and see what's going over there. The very word Sodom conjures up thoughts in your mind as you know that we live with that word to this day. And after a while, he didn't live near it. He was in Sodom. Lot was a believer. You know that because in the book of Peter, Peter says that Lot was vexed in his soul with what was going on. But he lived there, influenced his kids and influenced his wife, influenced him. Don't waste what God's done in your life. Um, 
Solomon said in the book of Ecclesiastes. You ever, you ever read this verse? He said, dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary <laughs> to send forth a stinking savor. That's found in, in uh, Ecclesiastes, listen to Ecclesiastes 10 and verse 1. Dead fly. The apothecary was the perfumer, uh, pharmacist, who would carry uh, uh, perfumes around. And if the lid ever cracked open, flies would be drawn to it, and then they'd die in it. it says, he said, dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. Then he said, so does a little folly to him that is in reputation for wisdom. He's saying when we allow little things to get into our life and we don't confess it and say, God, I'm sorry, cleanse my heart, get it on, we just allow it to go on, it's going to stink up our testimony. Why else do you think the Apostle Paul said to Timothy, Timothy, purge yourself from those things that will be worldly so that you can be a vessel fit for the Master's use. <laughs> the Scriptures are totally full of, of admonition that simply says to us, Live a life that's wholly dedicated to the Lord. That's why revival meetings are needed. That's why the daily time with the Lord is needed. That's why continual cleansing of your heart is desperately needed. Oh, God, you've gifted me to serve you, and I don't want to waste my life. When I was a kid, I used to look at ball players. I'd see some teenage guy. Sports was just way so very important in my life, probably way too important. And I'd see some guy that was much more talented as a ball player, faster, stronger, athletic. But they hung out with the crowd of the drug-taking crowd, the alcohol-consuming crowd. And then they'd, they'd go on. They could, they, could, they could do it for a while. And then their skill set just began to bottom out. And as a teenager, I would say, man, what a waste. Why are they doing that? But then you tell you, friends, multiply it much, much more. We're not talking about talent. We're talking about people who waste the giftedness that God's given you. Pursue God's gifts. Protect God's gifts. If you're not right with the Lord, get right with Him tonight. And then finally, perfect God's giftings. Perfect them. Improve them. Can I get you the rest of the chapter? Look at it. Don't just listen to an instruction. Let it be applied to your life tonight. He says in the beginning in verse 4, For as we have many members in one body, now he's talking about our human body, just like we have many members, and all members have not the same office or function. Well, of course not. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. We've already covered it. We need each one of us. Then he says, having then gifts differing according to the grace. It's a grace gift. We didn't deserve it. It's a gift from the Lord. According to the grace that's given to us. Then he starts giving this list. Again, I repeat, it's not the complete list of giftings you'll find in the New Testament. But he, he names a good list here. Whether prophecy... Let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or if it's ministry. Now, what's ministry? It, that, that's another word for serving. Ministry helps. Uh, uh, doing things like working in a nursery, working in a sound booth, uh, 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 doing other uh, things, uh, cleaning up after everybody leaves and so forth. A serving gift. Uh, let us wait on our ministry. In other words, he says, do it. Or he that's a teacher, he that teacheth on teaching. He that exhorteth. On exhortation. What's that mean? The word exhortation is the idea of urging someone on to, uh, uh, to, to, to take the truths of Scripture and apply it to their life and to live it out. Or he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity or with generosity. Now, that doesn't mean that others don't give. There are some people who have just been gifted with the ability to make a lot more good funds and then give to good causes. He that giveth, let him do it with generosity, simplicity. He that ruleth, <coughs> that's an administration gift. <coughs> That is, he knows how to organize things. Let him do it with a diligence, a faithfulness. And he that showeth mercy, let him do it with cheerfulness. Look, Paul is simply saying here, whatever it is that you've been gifted with, <laughs> use it. You say, Morris, how do I determine what God's gifted me to be? You get saved, you say, 
God, I sanctify my life into you. I, I, I just want to, I give it to you. I present it to you. And then thirdly, you start serving. You'll find yourself leaning towards certain areas that you're interested in. You just start going into things. You start looking at things. You start saying, you know, someone ought to do this. Let me get involved with this. Hey, can I help with this? And you'll find yourself doing those things which God has gifted you with and talented you and gifted you with to do the will of God and to be for the glory of God. Not your glory, but for His glory. He says here, if you've been gifted to teach, then start doing it. If you've been gifted as a, as a presenter of Bible truth, then find places where you can be a, a preacher. If you're an exhorter, do it. If you're to be a, a involved with giving and, and he that shows mercy, then find those areas of ministry and service. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, serve. Find a place to serve. Don't just sit. Don't be an audience. Be an army. And be involved with whatever it is that God has gifted you to be. Here's the way I like to say it. When we do what we do, in service to the Lord. I love this. Listen, let me give you five prepositions. We do it, we do it for Him. When you serve Him, you're doing it for Him. Not yourself, not anybody else. But not only you do it for Him, you do it with Him. And it's the greatest thing in the world. We, we've referenced the Holy Spirit in song and in statements here this week. Uh, the God, God comes inside, he's inside of you, and he helps you and me to do what he's gifted you to do. It's not up to you to make something, quote, happen. You do it with him. He goes with you and makes it possible for you to do what he's gifted you to do. You do it for him, you do it with him. Number three, you do it like him. <laughs> you know, Jesus is the, he was the fullness of Godhead bodily. Yeah. Every, every ability and giftedness was in the body of Christ. That's why we are representatives of the body of Christ. Here's the idea. Uh, we do it like Him. You're no more like Jesus Christ than, than when you're fulfilling the calling and the gifting of God in your life. You're doing it like Him. What He would do if He was here. Number four, you do it to Him. Jesus said, in that masterful sermon on the mount, he said, he said, when you give a gift and you serve other people, it's as if you're doing it unto me. When you do what you're doing, it's as if you're saying, Lord, I do this to you. I said to you on Sunday night, I asked the question, do you really love the Lord? I took us back to Peter's story. And he said, yes, I do. And he says, then, then feed my sheep, serve people. Because if you love me, you'll do it to me by serving other people. You do it for him, with him, like him, to him. Don't miss this. Because someday we will stand before him and simply say, God, I took what you gave me. I couldn't be like that missionary over in Southeast Asia. I couldn't be like that musician that's in our church. I couldn't be like that Sunday school teacher that taught me for years. But I took what you gave me. And Lord, I stand before you with what you gave me. And I, I tried to be faithful with what you gave me. When I was a boy, my dad loved baseball. And he taught me to love baseball. And I do. I mean, I do. I taught my two boys to love baseball. Boy, they did. And now they're teaching my grandsons to love the sport too. It's kind of fun. My dad always wanted me to be a shortstop. He always wanted to teach me how to play in the infield, and I loved it. And I, all through those years, loved to play shortstop. And I remember my very first team I ever played on, I was an eight-year-old boy, eight. You know, the attention span of an eight-year-old is about... Eight seconds. It's not very long, you know. I mean, they're not very into it. If you ever go to a little league game, you'll hear these little kids out there saying, hey, batter, batter, hey, batter, batter, when you're in the field. Hey, you know, because you're trying to distract him. And <clears throat> when the ball comes, swing, you know, trying to mess him up. But it's easy to get distracted. You're out there saying, hey, batter, batter, and somebody outside the field walks by eating a snow cone. You're going, hey, batter, batter. 
and you just start looking at that snow cone and then the ball comes and hits you in the head. I mean, it's going to... And if you play right field when you're at that age, there's a reason why you're out there in right field. Nobody ever hits out there. And so there's certain people that would always play. Now, if you played, I'm not talking about you, but I'm talking about on our teams. And so I'd look out there in right field, and our old right fielder, he'd just get so bored. Sometimes he'd just sit down on the ground, you know, and start p picking up grass. Sometimes he'd just lay down on the grass because the ball never came his way. I saw him one time with the ball glove on his face. He was just taking a nap, you know. And uh, he just waited for us to say, hey, Willie, come on, you know. And so I mean, that's the way. It was. Well, I remember the team one Saturday afternoon we were playing. My team was called the White Sox. We had these major league names. We were on the White Sox. And on that day, we were playing against the Red Sox. And, uh, and so uh, I remember the first batter, whoever, I don't know how he did it, but he got on first base. And uh, he was standing on first base. Well, my dad had told me when there's a runner on base, you want to get him out so he doesn't get in to score. He's called the lead runner. Well, our coaches had told us the same thing. Fellas, if you got someone on base, you got to get him out. So that was my thought. And I was thinking, I hope the ball comes to me because I want to get this guy off that's coming to first base, coming down to second base. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get him out before he goes any further. Well, the next batter came up and the ball came and he swung and the ball did come to me, but it was in the air. It was not on the ground. It was a, what we call a fly ball. If you know anything about baseball or softball, you know that it, when you catch a fly ball, uh, runners got to stay on their base. You gotta, he's got to stay on first base. And so, uh, but he didn't take a few steps off to see if I was going to catch it. He just took off running to second base. Again, eight-year-old boy. Well, I'm watching it out of the corner of my eye, and the ball is coming. I said, I got it. I got it. And in my heart, I was thinking, I hope. And, and, uh, and I was thinking, why is he running down to second? Maybe he thinks I can't catch it, and he may be right. And all of a sudden, the ball came down, and I caught it. I looked at him, I took the ball, and I threw it back to my first baseman. He caught it, another miracle. And when he caught it, he touched the first base bag. And the most shocked person on the field was the umpire. He pointed at me, he pointed at the first baseman, and he said, double play, two outs. Now, folks, when we got one out, we almost threw a party. I mean, it was like a big event, I'm telling you. It was huge. To get two outs, my team, the team went crazy. I mean, they just went, I saw a couple of gloves go up in the air. Yeah, you know, wow, this is great. Coaches were going, great job, guys. Guy in the right field said, what happened? And, uh, I mean, it was just kind of a big thing. And I was glad for all the excitement. I was thrilled about all that. I loved seeing the smile on my coach's face. But there was only one person I wanted to know what he thought. He was over there in the bleachers. If I live to be 180, I'll never forget looking over there and seeing the smile on his face. The one who had taught me how to play the game. And he smiled. And that's all that mattered. We sang channels only tonight. Blessed Master. I just want to be your channel to a world that needs you. And all you're going to want to hear someday is, here's the, here's the fruit of my life. And all you want to hear is his, see his smile and to hear him say, well done. You are my faithful and good servant. Well done. Pursue God's giftings. Protect them. Don't live in the world. You can't swim in the world and come out of it without being more like it. We're in the world, but don't be of the world. And then seek, seek to perfect your giftings by serving him. Let's bow our heads for prayer. You're no more like Jesus Christ than when you are doing what he would do if he was here, taking your gifts, your giftings, and fulfilling his calling in your life. With your heads bowed, would you just stand with me all over this room? Let's just stand. You've been seated.
for a while. Let's, let's keep our heads bowed. I've tried not to badger you when it comes time to responding to the Lord. I don't know what you need to do tonight. But as far as I'm concerned, I personally don't want to live the rest of my life just getting by. I want to daily fulfill the gifting and the calling in my life. And I pray you want the same. In just a moment, I'm going to pray, and then I would like to challenge you. If you'd like to sit back down, lean over the pew in front of you and say, God, use me like never before. Help me to manage your giftings that you've given me to your glory. Help me to steward them. That means to take care of them. Help me not to waste my life, my time. Tell him tonight. Just tell him. And if you say, Morris, I don't even know what it is. I, I can't really get a handle on, you know, you gave a few things of the gifts and you say that there are more giftings. I don't really know. I don't know how to find out. It starts by simply saying, Lord, here's my life. Just use me. We don't know how much time we have on this earth. Moses said, Lord, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. If you'd like to pray tonight and say, God, I sanctify my life unto you. I set it apart unto you once again. Then do it. Take time with your Lord. Have a seat and tell him tonight. If you want to get on your knees, find a place to do so. I don't know. But let's not, let's not just go through the routine. Say, God, use me like never before. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, if you're watching online, please contact the church. Maybe there'll be a, a number there, a text or an email number of some sort that you could contact. Let the church know. That would be wonderful. They'd love to talk with you. If you're here in the building tonight, don't go home tonight not knowing that you're on your way to heaven. That's the most important step of your life. Tonight, I pray that God's people will do what they should do. Father, finish this service with your anointing. I don't want to be in your way. I don't want to make, I don't want to force anything down anybody's throats. Lord, this truth so excites me. And I pray that in the midst of it, that you'll help each one of us to just simply recognize what it is you want us to be, not to waste any of our lives, of our times. God, help each one from the front to the back to say, God, for your glory, use me. I give you my life anew and afresh. Finish this service with your sweet presence. We ask it in your wonderful name. The time there is for you as the music begins. You do what you need to do, would you? Have a seat if you need to. Find a place to seek the Lord's face. I don't want to re-preach anything. You do what you need to do.
We're going to close our service by taking our hymn books, where you can follow the words on the screen, hymn number 367. I really think this is, again, an appropriate song for the end of a week of meetings. I, I think there's something in these verses that really was addressed throughout the week of meetings. Uh, the first verse, would you live for Jesus and be always pure and good? Would you walk with him within the narrow road? Would you have him bear your burden, carry all your load? That was the ministry of prayer that night. Let him have his way with thee. Let God be God in your life. And when we do that, the chorus will sing. We'll sing it maybe twice here through at least. His power can make you what you ought to be. That's powerful power. His blood can cleanse your heart and make you free. His love can fill your soul and you will see was best for him to have his way with thee. Will you do that? Will you let him have his way? Not just tonight, the close of a week of meetings, but I, I hope and pray that that will be your desire day in and day out. Let God have his way. And as he, as he leads us and you sense him leading, just continue to follow that lead and watch God do great things in and through you and all for his glory. Let's all stand as we close here, 367, His Way with Thee. Would you live for Jesus and me always pure and good? Would you walk with Him, with Him the narrow road? Would you have Him bear your burden, carry all your load? Let Him have His way with me. Find a place of constant rest. Would you in his kingdom find a place of constant rest? Would you bring the truth and call it in your task? Would you in his service labor always at your best? Thank you, brother, for coming for your ministry this week. I'm going to ask you to step to the back, greet the folks on the way out. I want to thank you all for being here tonight. Trust the Lord again. We'll bless the balance of your week. See you on Sunday.